So we are here now for the last session of GPF. Over the last three days, we've all tried to provide each other with new insights on climate change, evidence-based options for action, and here at, for us at GPF and World Affairs, a venue, albeit virtually, for us to consider what impact we can make for the greater good. Yet simply presenting forceful facts and new perspectives is not enough. I think people generally know what the right thing to do is. Intellectually and big picture, um, they completely understand the climate is getting warmer and that this is ultimately a bad thing. What is just as crucial and something that has been a common theme throughout this whole conference is getting people to actually do something and to do something collectively. So, but this is incredibly hard to accomplish and it requires the ability, I would say, some say a gift to create emotional and causal connections to words and ideas, and connections that convince people they have control, they have purpose and they can make a difference. And oftentimes these words are organized into compelling narratives that somehow change behavior and set what were seemingly radical policy agendas. So with this as prefacing, I am just so delighted to be here with the 2016 Nobel Peace Prize recipient, President Juan Manuel Santos, who knows something about what it takes to motivate and move a deeply divided population into common action. As you know well, President Santos was honored by the Nobel Committee for his pivotal role in ending the 50-year civil war in his country of Colombia. And he's also well known for being a staunch advocate for protecting the environment and ending poverty through innovative policies and grassroots organizing. And so as we close GPF 2020, we are turning to President Santos for optimism, hope, and inspiration. President Santos, welcome so much. It's just a privilege for you to join us and for us to host you. Uh, you're joining us from Colombia, right? Right. And thank you very much. I'm very honored to participate in this very important event. And uh, I hope that we can give some good ideas of how to tackle the difficult but challenging future that we have. Great. So let's get to it. You recently declared at the World Economic Forum that humanity, quote, humanity and nature are further out of alignment than ever before, end quote. From this statement in your writings and speeches, you, you clearly hold dear the idea that all people are connected to the earth, maybe, you know, organically. And, and within that context, you are outspoken about the need to incorporate the priorities of indigenous populations around the world, essentially social equity. So with the threats from declining biodiversity, more flood, more flooding from sea level rise, uh, resulting in sea level rise, uh, uh, fires burning hotter and longer and more widespread, and, and even the global pa pandemic, um, these are all affecting the poor and the weak, more so. So what can the global community do in your mind to restore what you think is this balance? Well, I learned from the indigenous communities when I first met them how important it is to understand precisely the connection with nature. And uh, they gave me a, a perfect example. Uh, it was a river, very important river in Colombia, that was uh, having a lot of problems, uh, a lot of floods, uh, wetlands that would be destroyed. And they showed me how if you understand that the river has life and that uh, it reacts to uh, whatever the human being uh, does to it, uh, then you will start respecting the river and respecting what surrounds the river. And that was a great lesson for me because from there, I understood uh, the connection with other priorities that we should have today in terms of maintaining our uh, biodiversity and uh, fighting climate change. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Colombia, we were the ones who proposed the SDGs back in the year 2012. 
um, and uh, you all know about the negotiation and how this came about. And I took to the indigenous communities, the SDGs, and I told them, look, this is uh, something that has been done uh, on your behalf, because they were uh, the guardians of, of, of nature. And they studied the SDGs and said, well, we think that's a step in the right uh, direction, but it's lacking something very important. And I said, what? And uh, they said the spiritual component. Uh, the world needs to understand that all these uh, SDGs, that all the objectives, uh, you, don't, you cannot only uh, reach them if you feel uh, in your inside that you're dealing with something that is at your same at the same level. And I asked them, what do you mean? And, and they very simply explained to me, uh, the uh, humans have tried to dominate nature. And that is a big mistake. Nature has to be treated as an equal. And you have to live with nature and live by the laws of nature. Otherwise, nature will get mad and will react. Um, and I suffered that. I suffered that. And they, advi they advised me that I was going to suffer that. We had the worst Nina phenomenon uh, about a, a month after they told me this. And they said, see, this is the way nature reacts when, it's, when it feels that, that it's being mistreated. So that aspect, I think, is extremely important, that we need to understand that the trees have life, that the rivers have life, that nature uh, is a basic component of our uh, well-being and that we have to treat nature with respect. And that, for me, was a great, great lesson. So let's. You, you mentioned the UN uh, Sustainable Sustainable Development Goals or the SDGs. You you've been a champion for those, and you've been working for many years on ways using those as a way to um, eradicate poverty. Um, and so, can policies designed to eradicate poverty also impact climate in positive ways? And for us, you know, we have so many people here who are involved in philanthropy who are funders. Um, what are the clear connect, you know, are there clear connections between philanthropic work, the SDGs and climate change and, and what more in your mind can be done? Oh, yes, there is a very clear connection and I will give you a specific example. Um, Colombia and also Brazil, we're having a tremendous problem with deforestation, which has a, a terrible impact on the world. Uh, and one of the causes of deforestation is poverty. So uh, trying to uh, fight poverty will impact directly uh, the deforestation to, to lessen uh, the rate of deforestation or if possible, reverse it. And therefore there is a connection. And there are ways in, in uh, more effective to fight poverty. We started in Colombia, there was a, the pilot project, now about 60 countries have it, to measure poverty in a different way. Uh, the traditional way, the way that uh, the World Bank and the IMF and many international organizations measure poverty is by income. Uh, well, there are many theories, and I mentioned specifically a former professor of mine, Amartya Sen, who af afterwards won the Nobel uh, Prize in Economics that said, no, no, this is a wrong way to measure poverty. You have to measure poverty um, according to the basic needs of families, address those needs, and that will help you fight poverty with a, in, in a more effective way. And I did that. And for the last 10 years, Colombia has been probably the country in the whole region, the whole of Latin America, where poverty and extreme poverty has been lowered the most because it allowed the, uh, the government to focus on those aspects that have the, the largest impact uh, on fighting poverty. So that's a clear example. 
Okay, and then, so uh, just a reminder for the audience, um, through the chat function, if you do have questions for President Santos, please go ahead and type them in. Um, we've got a whole slew of questions and I'll try to integrate them as best we can. We only have about 20 minutes or so. Um, and it's not a lot, but we'll see what we can do. So very quickly, uh, you know, let's talk about climate change specifically. You kind of alluded to that in your last, um, your, you know, uh, just a few moments ago, but what is Colombia doing directly uh, um, how it's being affected by climate change, and what do you see are promising efforts that they're um, starting to to use in order to mitigate? Well, uh, we are very vulnerable to climate change because we are uh, one of the richest countries in terms of biodiversity. With we are the most biodiverse country per square kilometer in the whole planet, so biodiversity affects us very much, and uh, we started protecting the biodiversity by uh, enlarging the protected areas uh, of the country where where the biodiversity is concentrated and also giving the indigenous communities a much more important role in uh, protecting the forest and the biodiversity they are really the ones who really uh, feel uh, the importance of doing this so they are ideal partners in in that uh, uh, venture. And uh, we have been uh, not only protecting the areas inland, but also we have two oceans, the, Carib the Atlantic, the Caribbean, and the Pacific. Uh, and there we have also a very rich uh, uh, environment, and we have been protecting those areas. Uh, and we also put in place for the, it was for the first uh, country in Latin America, a carbon tax uh, to to finance and with a specific objective to finance uh, all the, what is needed for the protection of the protected areas to effectively work. Many countries have protected areas, but you go there and they're not really in practice protected. So we did that and I think that is working quite well. Uh, we need to do a lot more uh, to fight deforestation and uh, we ha have to continue uh, doing something extremely important. We are a very rich country in oil and coal, and we have to, uh, to uh, change our paradigm to go into renewable energies. That takes a lot of persuasion uh, because the economic incentive to continue um, producing coal and producing oil is, is very big, as you all know. And so there, uh, the work of uh, of the world and of uh, all the organizations to to understand the importance of this uh, change towards renewable energies is, is very, very important at this time, especially after the pandemic. If we want to build back better. I think uh, that's one key aspect. Well, speaking of the pandemic, which is something we obviously, you know, need to ask you about, and I think others have our talk, you know, are very uh, want to know about the 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 situation in Colombia, sort of politically as well. So, how is Colombia faring in the midst of the COVID nineteen pandemic, and is that affecting? you know, the peace negotiations and the discussions with the FARC that you worked on so hard during your eight years as, as president? Well, we are not doing very well with the pandemic. We started doing very well, but uh, unfortunately, uh, the rate of uh, infection uh, has been maintained and we are now uh, one of the countries with the highest number of people uh, affected by the pandemic. We have not had as much people dying, but uh, unfortunately, the number is increasing. Um, and I think we we failed in in doing a coordinated effort, especially uh, on things like uh, uh, the um, way to to uh, put forward the uh, the exams and the and the. Uh, following of the people who were infected. We we came in there too late, and I think that was a mistake. Now, the effect of the pandemic, as everywhere, has been devastating in economic terms and in social terms. And uh, uh, we're going back uh, 10, 20, maybe 30 years in what we had advanced uh, in equality 
and in poverty. And that, of course, uh, is very bad for reconciliation. However, the, the, um, the peace agreement with the FARC, uh, that is irreversible. That, that will not be affected. But violence and uh, the presence of a phenomenon like the drug trafficking uh, and the illegal crops uh, will be stimulated by the consequences of the pandemic. So we have to be much more uh, proactive in counteracting those effects. So here's a question from the audience along those lines about conflict. So in your experience, does climate change necessarily lead to more conflicts or is there a basis to expect greater solidarity and collaboration in the face of a threat multiplier? In other words, can pandemic or climate change really mobilize uh, and be wor- can be used to our, to our advantage? Well, unfortunately, we thought that uh, something like the pandemic would uh, help uh, defuse conflicts, but th- that was not the case. Even the Secretary General of the UN made a, a call for a ceasefire in all the internal conflicts, and uh, nobody really paid much attention. Um, and uh, uh, climate change, unfortunately, uh, especially because, for example, the migration that climate change produces will increase tensions. And um, uh, we have to be aware of that and uh, hopefully try to uh, make people understand that a way to uh, avoid or mitigate conflict uh, is also fighting climate change because the effect is not positive, the effect is negative. So quickly, we have a few more minutes left. Two real fast questions here I wanted to get in. So um, you recently joined the Elders Group, uh, a group of independent global leaders committed to working together for peace and human rights. We've already heard from your uh, fellow members, uh, uh, Chair Mary Robertson, Robinson and Deputy Chair Ban Ki-moon. Um, what are your top takeaways, two takeaways from this group um, uh, of philanthropists who are ready to take on climate change? Well. First of all, we have to reverse the trend uh, against multilateralism. If we don't uh, cooperate more among countries and within countries, but especially among countries, it's going to be very difficult to address the issues that we are confronting after the pandemic. Uh, So that is one uh, specific uh, uh, target, Uh, strengthen multilateralism, uh, strengthen the the UN and, and what the UN represents and wants to achieve. And uh, the second uh, point, which I think is directly con- uh, uh, concerned with this forum, is uh, you were talking about collective action. I am a great believer in uh, the value of collective intelligence and collective action. And uh, the role that the philanthropist can play uh, is a very important role because uh, the money uh, that and the investments and the programs that are funded by philanthropists are w- much better received by the communities than the money or the um, projects that are funded s- exclusively by governments or by the private sector. Uh, there's no political objectives, there's no profit, and usually it's, it's more transparent. So. Uh, the UN, or what the UN represents, and uh, targeting those areas that are most profitable from the social point of view, fighting poverty, fighting climate change, and of course uh, the elders have always been uh, advocates of uh, uh, fighting nuclear proliferation, which is one of the big dangers that this world has, unfortunately, still. So we have maybe about 30 seconds left. I don't know if you can do it in this period of time, but you know, people take so much inspiration from you and what you've been able to accomplish at Columbia when people thought there was a problem that was just impossible to solve. Are there words of encouragement um, that you can give us as we end GPF um, and we go out to, to make a difference and make an impact? Well, you just mentioned it. Everybody in Colombia and in the region, in Latin America, thought that this war that we had with the 
uh, oldest and strongest guerrilla for over 50 years uh, could not be ended. And we did. So there's a phrase that has been uh, used very, very often here. We made uh, possible what we thought was impossible. And I am absolutely convinced that every conflict can be solved. If you have the correct uh, uh, incentives and you have the correct diagnosis of how to solve those conflicts. There is no conflict that cannot be solved. Okay, with those words um, about doing the impossible, um, I want to thank you, President Santos, for uh, taking the time and for being with us. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Philip, and thank you all. You do a great job, and uh, I'm very grateful, and the world should be very grateful to all the the philanthropists that do such good work and such important work. Thank you. So this brings us to the end of GPF 2020, our first ever virtual conference and my first as CEO of World Affairs and GPF. Um, as I think back over the past three days, three things come to mind. First, time is of the essence. We are at an inflection point with climate change and we must act now. I think Larry Kramer's call to action at the very beginning is exactly what's needed. Please keep that in mind. Secondly, I think we need to act, I, what I bring from the conference, we need to act locally. We have to experiment and we have to do it with others. Innovation is not going to come from national governments but from social entrepreneurs like all of you, connecting with smart people like all of you in different intellectual spaces, working together as a community to solve the big problems on the ground. I hope while you were there, while you've been here virtually, you've met someone that you would not have met otherwise. And finally, any meaningful movement on climate change cannot happen without the energy and drive of young people. Bill McKibben, talked about 10 million Greta Thunbergs that are out there. He also raised, which I thought was interesting, was the idea of getting the older people involved. I think that's a very interesting idea. In either case, both generations on both ends, they are pushing and they're pulling. And I think they are and have shown that they've made a difference in 2020. And I hope we can support their efforts. So as we close, pl please remember what we started with, our touchstones, insight, action and purpose. And we at World Affairs and GPF will be working with you to allow to follow up on what actions we are going to be taking as a community. And finally, before we sign off, I want to have you join me in thanking our entire staff. We've got uh, Claire McMahon, uh, Megan Kennedy, and Carla Thorson. Um, you just did an amazing job uh, putting this all together. And I want to thank all of you for joining us uh, from all over the world to participate in this event. And most importantly, following up with us as we try to deal with this very important problem of climate change. Everyone, please be safe and please stay healthy. Thank you so much. <laughs>